Hey everybody, um, my name is Tim May. Uh, some of you may know me as Farmer Tim on social media. And uh, we have a dairy farm uh, in Rockwood, Ontario, not too far from where East Gen is located in Guelph. Uh, so it's great to have them um, service our farm. And uh, you might be wondering why I'm here talking to you about uh, mental health today. Um, but I'm what you call an advocate. So someone who advocates for agriculture in a positive way. Um, and uh, Canada, Ontario, we're blessed to have some amazing advocates. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are, are advocates of your own way. So, so thanks for your support. And why do we do it? Well, um, I have a whole presentation on that itself. But, uh, you know, we try to make it a difference. Um, and um, my target is generally consumers. Um, and I have a lot of uh, consumers from, from large urban centers that follow me, but I do get a lot of farmers follow me as well, and, and they give support and help me answer questions um, and ultimately end up talking about mental health and, and agriculture because it, it is a big issue and there's a lot of stigma. And um, we're always talking about uh, you know animal welfare um, on my social media and stuff, but what about the human side? What about the farmer welfare? You know, we take care of our animals, we take care of our land, but what about taking care of ourselves? So on social media, uh, it's great. I, I try to be just like like every other consumer. I, I share my good days. Uh, it could be a bumper crop of hay, a, a birth of a newborn calf. And I also share my bad days. So my bad days are some of my most uh, popular posts, believe it or not, because I think people like, uh, you know, misery likes company kind of thing and, and realize that they're not alone with their challenges and struggles. And farmers, of course, have lots of unique uh, struggles and challenges. Um, I'm sure you've all had lots of uh, stories on your farm you could share. Uh, and some days are a little bit shittier than others, to be honest with you. Um, and just to go back to the pandemic, you know, social distancing farmers are, you know, the ultimate social distancers. We, we hardly get off the farm, but the pandemic really exacerbated that. And, uh, and we hardly ever left the farm at all. Uh, we missed out on, uh, on local fairs um, and events held by feed companies and veterinary clinics and stuff to get people together to learn and to, to share a meal. And, uh, and uh, we really, really, really were lacking in that. And uh, thankfully, things are getting a little bit back to normal. Um, and, and that's helped a lot. Um, but, you know, there's still a lot of uh, challenges uh, that farmers are facing out there and, and people in general. And if you're like me uh, on your social media, you see everyone has a perfect life. It seems, you know, they have like a beautiful house or a beautiful farm and, and bumper crops and everything's always good. Um, but uh, believe you, me, um, there's lots of things going on and struggles behind the, the scene of those people and those families and those farms. And, uh, you know, don't don't believe that you're alone. Everyone has their challenges and some people just aren't as uh, honest in sharing those. So some of the things that we, we have challenges with, um, one is um, those, you know, coming up, like I starting to feel it now, the shorter days, getting up in the morning when it's dark, it's going to bed uh, earlier because it's dark. Um, you know, the lonely, lonely time sometimes. And I've had farmers reach out to me that uh, actually are farming alone. They've either lost their spouse or their children have moved away. And, and it's a huge struggle to to do this day in, day out on your own. Uh, cold weather approaching, you know, frozen pipes, shoveling snow. Um, it's a challenge in itself. And uh, not a lot of people realize the challenges of working outside um, is, is tremendous on a mental health strain. Quite the opposite of that is humidity. Um, I hate humidity. It makes me grumpy, but uh, not only does it affect me, uh, it affects my animals. They, they give less milk. Um, they can get lame. They have product or, um, reproductive issues. So, you know, the weather affects, you know, animal health and mental health. Uh, this was a rain uh, storm. It was like 30% chance of rain that day. Supposed to be good most of the week. Cut all my hay, and that 30% chance of rain decided to rain over my farm and my hay fields. Uh, and the neighbors were spared that day, thankfully. But uh, you know, even when you try to make plans around things to make things uh, work out perfectly, they don't always go go well. That's part of the uh, you know struggles that farmers have. Um, I don't know. This year in um, in my little part of the world, uh, we had extreme drought. Even kilometers away from me, we're, we're fine. But we had simply no rain pretty much all summer. We had one decent rain uh, partway through. It was a little too late to help most things. Um, 
this wasn't from this year. This is from a previous year of, of drought. Um, but you know, people say, Hey, you got crop insurance for that, but, um, yeah, that, that might be the case, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to find feed for your animals. Cause if your neighbors are all suffering drought, uh, you know, it's going to be challenging and it's going to be expensive. And then finally those rains come, you know, and, and I remember posting this, uh, uh, a friend of mine, um, just to show you how relative uh, rain is, they uh, were upset and posted on their social media that they had to cancel their golf tournament that day because uh, of the rain. Meanwhile, I'm uh, celebrating, you know, finally some rain to, to help feed the population out there. And you get that rain and you're like, oh, you get that bumper crop. And you look at that bumper crop before it's ready to harvest and it's infected with uh, with insects or disease. Um, I remember this this particular year, I didn't, it's the first time I had seen these. I think it's a Western bean cutworm and um, peeled back the husks and there they were everywhere and uh, opened up the, the cob to all kinds of molds and diseases as it, as it rained. Um, so even when you get bumper crops, you, uh, you know, you have your struggles and there's things that you can't really control. I'm keeping a better eye open for them. I haven't seen them since, but uh, hopefully they don't come back soon. And when you uh, have livestock, you have a lot of responsibility, um, you know, and, and we make our living off of animals. But that doesn't mean that we don't care about them. Um, if, if seldom do I have a, a sick animal, you know, preventative medicine is, is the key. But when you do, you worry about them. You're up in the night. You, you don't want them to suffer. Uh, you want them to have the best life possible. So, um, you know, that's a huge mental health uh, a challenge for, for a lot of people. I'm, I'm very much an empath when it comes to my animals and my family. Uh, my daughter, Abby, uh, this was her first year of university uh, during the COVID outbreak. Uh, I told her it would be the best years of her life, you know, Aggie pubs and meeting new people, but stuck at home at the table all day in front of a, a screen. Um, and, and that wasn't the worst of it. It was um, the rural internet really, really does suck. Uh, we have high um, uh, fast speed fiber optic cables being uh, laid around us with the uh, the uh, Ontario government plan to make everyone have uh, high speed internet. But uh, it just skirted our farm. They said it wasn't cost effective to come down and, and serve the few uh, rural people that were on our road. So we feel uh, really uh, forgotten and um, that people don't care. And, and we have a business too, and we need uh, technology to run it. Long days, uh, long nights, you know, that's par part of farming, harvesting, planting. Uh, this is during hay time. Um, but as a dairy farmer, you know, I don't get to sleep in or catch up my sleep. It's like up early the next day to get those cows milked and, and back at it again. And, and I love what I do, thankfully, but it, uh, it really wears you down when you're tired. Um, urban encroachment. Uh, this is at a neighbor's farm that we uh, we rent the land on. They sold the back part of their farm to um, development, um, which is they can do what they want. But it, it really puts a uh, a little bit of a damper on things with the feel like you're farming under a, a magnifying glass. And um, and I try to have a good relationship with everyone, and so far so good. But uh, it is stressful when you're when you're back there working. You're wondering what people think. And with the urban encroachment, you know, we have trespassing. Um, these snowmobile trails uh, went past all three of these signs across this wheat field. Um, and in the spring came, uh, there was pretty much a highway of, um, of dead um, wheat across this whole field that turned into the 401. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sad that people don't, don't respect property and, and signs. Um, and the garbage, too, that was, uh, you know, we're always talking to the environment and stuff, but... You know, people need to realize that uh, we're taking care of things. They need to take care of the environment, too. And then uh, with this slide of talking about my personal health, um, if you follow me a few years ago, I had fallen on the ice. I gave myself a concussion. I lost my memory for half an hour um, and I was at a work for a little while. And um, I probably pushed myself back to work a little quicker than I should have um, just because of the nature of my work, which isn't a good thing, I realize. Um, didn't follow people's advice. I'm a stubborn old farmer. Um, and when I when I fell, it was right at chore time. It's right at milking time, and there was no one, no one to uh, do my chores for me. Um, my son was doing an apprenticeship. My wife's at work. My daughter's at school. Um, my parents are no longer able to help. Um, but my neighbors luckily stepped in, and, and we got through it. But um, that was a huge mental health issue. You know, I be, should be thinking about myself, but I was thinking about my animals. And then they say, hey, get away, have a vacation. And when you do, this is our, our farm pond, which is we're thankful to have. But um, when you do get a chance to go away, um, first of all, you got to find someone that you trust. 
And when you're away, um, there's so many little things that could go wrong. And if you're a person like me, a bit of a micromanager, a little bit of a workaholic, it's really hard to let go. Um, some people are better at it than others. But, uh, you know, when you have all those animals with unique needs and it's your livelihood, you really um, need to trust that person that's looking after your, your animals. And, and they're really hard to find. And then, of course, commodity prices. Um, I do very little cash crop, but for those of you who do, I have my hat off to you. You know, like one day difference in selling can make a, a huge change. You could sell it and it could jump up or, or it could go down the day before you sell it. Who knows? It's a, it's a stressful business to be in. Of course, politics. We won't talk about politics too much. We all have, uh, have our issues with, um, with governments and, and policies and stuff. I don't want to get this too depressing. Um, and of course, uh, barn fires and, and tornadoes and, and things like that. Like you imagine waking up and your barn is on fire, you lose your animals, or, or if you're lucky enough to save your animals, where are they going to go? Do you have a plan? Like, I often think of that, you know, I don't really know what options I would have. It's the middle of winter, say, like, it's cold, like uh, your feed's all all gone in the fire. It's uh, It's really hard to know what to do. Then, of course, there's the social media itself. Um, all the myths and misperceptions, misconceptions that are on social media are, are a huge issue, and farmers don't realize how much they're affected by it. Um, there's so much stuff on there, anthropomorphism, uh, activist groups, um, people talking about all the horrible things about milk and its pus and blood and the cancer it causes and, and stuff that drives farmers nuts. And that's what got me on the social media to begin with. Um, all the while, um, less than 2% of us who are farmers know the truth behind it. And, um, you know, trying to get that information out to 98% of the population, um, with all that other misinformation going around is a real, real challenge. Um, talking about animal rights as a dairy farmer, we're always getting animal rights updates and warnings and stuff. And, um, uh, through DFO, just, you know, lock your doors, you know, watch out for this and that. And uh, on my own social media, I've been attacked uh, a few times on mass, uh, very rarely, but when I do, it, it is nasty. It, it goes around the world. Um, it gets very personal. Uh, you're getting lots of negative comments. Um, and, um, you know, like this one, for instance, like what kind of person says this? Um, I posted a while ago on uh, about uh, a, a fellow farmer who uh, had taken his life, um, very jovial, very... Uh, personable guy that no one really thought would uh, would commit suicide but uh, when I posted about him um, I had an activist comment um, you know no wonder farmers take their lives it must be hard on your psyche killing so many animals and um, the irony of that was uh, on his little profile photo it said you know choose kindness so these are the kind of kind of people you have to deal with it's really hard this was uh, in Australia, uh, a couple hundred activists uh, surrounded this uh, farm family, uh, a parent, two, uh, a mother, father, and, and two children, and uh, hurled insults at them um, and threatened them. And, and how horrific is that? In a very remote area. So these are all things that we deal with um, on a frequent basis. You know, you've all been there. Um, but what happens if things are a little bit deeper and darker than, than you expect? Well, um, research done by my friend Andrea jones Bitten out of the University of Guelph. Uh, Andrea is a veterinarian who studies mental health in farmers and veterinarians. Uh, she studied 1,100 producers across Canada, and she found that 45% had high stress. 68% uh, of farmers are more susceptible to chronic stress than the general population. No surprise there. 35% uh, met the criteria for depression. 58% showed anxiety. And 40% of um, producers would feel uncomfortable seeking help um, if they needed it because of the stigmas out there. And just uh, one more little stat here. Um, before the pandemic, it found that one in eight farmers um, had thought about committing suicide or, or taking their life. But post-pandemic, it was one in four. So just to show how dramatic the pandemic has affected us all, especially farmers. So um, thankfully, farmers have come to come to the aid and uh, speak up about it to help break the stigma. And uh, I'm certainly here to help do that as well. And a shout out to East Gen themselves for, uh, you know, uh, supporting mental health. Um, they all know very well that um, some of their producers are struggling and, uh, you know, some of them uh, are doing fine too, but uh, the ones that are struggling really need some help. So thank you for your support.
And out of all this, um, the Newmore Agricultural Foundation was formed. It's the, uh, I think it was the first Canadian mental health association that specifically targeted farmers and gave resources about farmers. So I, I suggest you go check out their information on their website, uh, the Dumore Ag Foundation. And out of the University of Guelph, the In the Know, um, uh, as an amazing uh, uh, resource and an amazing program um, to help promote and um, let people understand how serious mental health can be with uh, farmers um, and gives you lots of tools and, and way to identify people who are struggling or maybe considering suicide. So I suggest you all check out the In the Know program. And farmers took up, uh, you know, in arms, the, lots of articles and stuff on, on mental health. Um, I was talking to a fellow advocate and we, we sometimes worry that maybe there's almost too much of this information out there and people are just getting immune to it. But um, uh, I stress that we need to keep talking about it to get that, that stigma down because more and more farmers are getting help. Uh, anywhere I go, uh, communities, uh, I've talked, um, buildings are packed. Um, this one here, uh, for example, was uh, packed with people, and I'd say only one or two of them are farmers. It was just the community um, coming together because they really want to support and, and farmers. Farmers are really well loved. You know, majority of, of consumers love us, so so don't uh, worry about the uh, the small minority that uh, that don't. And it's not just a uh, Canadian issue. This is in Tasmania, the, the Blue Farmer Program. They knitting uh, farmers and things that are blue baler twine to bring awareness. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, in Australia, the Naked Farmer, check out their website. It's it's not as uh, shocking as it seems. It's uh, farmers, uh, you know, in tastefully naked photos, um, you know, covered up here and there. But um, telling a story, sometimes funny, but uh, but highlighting the, the mental health struggles that they have, and um, it's it's uh, it's an amazing an amazing uh, organization. Um, more locally, the Listowel Agricultural Society, I think the ambassador program had raised money to help form the Farmers Toolbox uh, mental health resources. Um, one of the most amazing. Uh, places I've seen for resources on mental health. So I really highly suggest you go check that out, uh, send it to a friend who's in need or, or maybe find some information yourself. It's quite quite fascinating and, and very useful. Uh, Government Ontario recently came out with the Farmer Wellness uh, Initiative. Um, I was slightly part of that, I guess, in some of the roundtable discussions. I'm um, glad to see that they acted on it. Um, it is run um, when you call, you talk to someone who's been trained with agricultural um, about agricultural issues. Um, they should be able to hopefully help you and talk to you. Um, so I highly recommend you go check out their website and they have amazing information and links as well. And sadly, when I saw the... Um, um, Ministry of Agriculture for Ontario share this, uh, our Federation of Agriculture, um, there was a lot of negative comments and farmers thinking, you know, like it's government pushing it down our throat and leave us alone. But, uh, you know, if you're not suffering, that's fine. But uh, this is for not for those people. This is for the people who, who need it, who are silently, you know, behind the scenes, not saying, hey, I'm, I'm over here suffering. Please help me. A lot of people aren't reaching out for help, but things like this really do help. And I know this from experience from talking to to farmers. Um, I found in my own life, my my parents um, learned a lot about their own mental health. Uh, a few years ago, my dad, um, he's hes in an electric wheelchair now. He's, he's not very mobile at all, but uh, a couple of years ago, he was able to do some planting. He finally got to a point he couldn't get up on the tractors. And I told him, I said, you know, maybe it's time you took a break. And his response was to uh, build a step on all the tractors to help get up. So I realized it was, wasn't just about the work. It was actually about being a part of things. So it was good for his mental health. Um, and then the second photo is the uh, same kind of thing. He used to look at, after the heifers in our second barn, and he would um, take the feed cart uh, that he made specially. It's his feed cart walker, I call it. And he'd take his golf cart to the barn and get on his walker and go to his feed cart walker. And then uh, had a little pusher that pushed the, uh, the hay away from the wheels and a little funnel that funneled the grain away from the wheels so that he could get up and down the barn. So I thought that was pretty ingenious. It helped him do the things he loved a little longer. And the pandemic hit, um, and I realized that, uh, you know, my 
my family's social outlet was uh, was their ch- local church, especially for my parents. Uh, a lot of our neighbors and friends and people in the community went there to uh, you know have a social social gathering. Um, and um, so we graduated from the cell phone to an iPad. But I remember the day that uh, we logged them on and they had their first online service. Um, and uh, you know to see their friends and, and neighbors' faces again, they they all lit up and they were pretty excited by the technology. So it was great. And just bringing uh, this is my son's cow Vanilla. She's got thousands of followers on social media. But just bringing her up to visit them really uh, brought a smile to their their face during the pandemic. Um, picking stones, we all love it. It causes lots of mental health issues on its own, and um, not to downplay mental health, but. Uh, it's, it's something we don't really love. And I remember this day at a neighbor's farm. Thankfully, we don't have a lot of farms, but it's not called our, a lot of rocks on our farm, but a uh, so neighbor's farm has a lot of rocks. It's not called Rockwood for nothing. And they begged me to, to take a break, and I'm not one to really take breaks. I'm a bit of a workaholic. You know, I just want to get the job done. But they convinced me, um, and we went and built some... Um, balancing rock sculptures um, which was kind of cool and very therapeutic and we actually got done a little faster because we were hurrying to get back to the end of the field to to dump some rocks and make some more um, rock sculptures so I thought that was a that was kind of a good lesson to be learned and I've taken something I hate and turned it into something I love and uh, and picking up uh, rocks uh, and making a rock wall. And, and I actually did uh, minor in geology at the uh, university to try to turn my hate for rocks into something that uh, I enjoyed. And just in our backyard, uh, a lot of you guys have, uh, you know, back 40, you, you don't realize the space you had until the pandemic hit and uh, how lucky we are. We have some forest on our property. And as a kid, I used to explore it and I haven't explored it for years. So I brought out that kid with me and, and took my kids back. And we had a, a great old time uh, exploring the forest and, and bringing an appreciation of what we have back uh, into our lives. And then another thing, uh, some exercise. I've been learning that, uh, you know, it's you know, getting up, milking cows, forking some manure, doing all these kind of things, driving tractors is work, but it's not the cardiovascular work that uh, my mind needs for mental health. And as I get older, I realize that I need to be out doing a little bit more of that working. You know, you don't lose weight as quick as you used to. And um, of course, uh, eating is uh, always a challenge uh, for farmers. We, we, you generally eat really well and if we're not burning off those calories you know that extra weight and um, you know it really makes you sluggish and it, it doesn't affect your mental health and I'm not a dietitian but uh, I know from experience uh, you know you are what you eat I can't eat like I used to uh, little things you can do on your farm um, you know our barn was built in 1960s sometimes reading um, in magazines you know that come in the mail agricultural magazines but all the latest equipment you know we've got tractors from we got new stuff but we have tractors from like you know, my grandpa's 1930 uh, tractor that uh, we have and in my dad's old 1953 super m we still use but um um you know there's nothing wrong with those things i think it's kind of cool actually but uh take something that you have that's old turn it into something um that's new and exciting you may not have a new robot barn or something like that but at least make uh what you have a place that you'll enjoy working in um you know just we put in a bunch of led lights brighten up the barn you know keeping the cows clean that, that makes a a huge difference on your mental health and your perspective when you're when you're working Something my wife and I have implemented. Uh, we've been trying to do the uh, Bruce Trail from end to end. It's going to take us forever. I keep telling her to leave the uh, some of the easy road sections and stuff for my for my wheelchair days when I get older. But um, you know, it's it's something we can uh, do at the drop of a hat if we have a minute. Uh, um, we have to drive a little farther now. The price of gas is maybe not as easy, but uh, it's amazing. It's taken us to places we didn't know existed in our own backyard. So I highly recommend uh, getting out, do some exploring. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we all work with families, uh, and, uh, believe you me, it's, um, it's not always easy working with, uh, with your, with your family uh, and a family farm, you know, my dad and I have had our struggles and, and my kids and I have had our struggles and, and such, but, um, you know, you find ways that, uh, you can work together and, um, and, and talk things through. 
Uh, volunteering uh, is a huge part of uh, of helping with your mental health. Uh, this is the Rockwood Farmers Prairie Delights. I don't know if some of you may have been. It starts at the farm next door to us. It's completely voluntary, no advertising. Um, about 20,000 people uh, um, descend on our little town of Rockwood each year. Um, it's, 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 pretty, uh, it's pretty cool. It makes everyone happy. And just to see the smiles on the, on the consumers' faces um, and the farmer, my fellow farmers' faces is, is amazing. Uh, my wife Kirsten is a veterinarian um, by trade, uh, large, small. Um, she runs her own business at the moment and does a bit of locuming. But uh, on the side, she volunteers as a uh, as a first responder for the uh, uh, Turtle Conservation Center out in Peterborough. Uh, if a turtle's injured, she'll give it pain meds, and, and um, people will drop off the injured turtle, or she'll harvest the eggs if it is deceased and it has eggs. And they go on to be incubated and uh, the people you meet and then the difference you make uh, is pretty is pretty amazing it's it's a great way to give back and then of course um you know taking some time for yourself you know i i, I love cutting hay um there's nothing wrong with that and i love the smell of fresh cut hay um and but you know you need to do stuff for yourself and not just be working all the time um, and you shouldn't have to make a list of things like I, I do. I told you I'm a workaholic. I'm always liking to work. Um, but, but take a little bit of time for yourself. And, and like I said, your own backyard, like, like, um, stop, smell the roses, smell that fresh cut hay, smell that corn silage, um, you know, breathe the, uh, that fresh air, you know, and, um, it's, you kind of forget that you are working in paradise and, um, you, you just can't take that for granted. Uh, just a, a garden, a family garden. I didn't realize how important it is on our on our farm. You know, our family working together, um, planting, weeding, um, looking after insects, and then harvesting the fruits of our labor. Sharing that with the food bank, sharing that with neighbors. It's a it's a huge thing to do. It, it's I didn't realize the mental health benefits of it. Weeding isn't always good for the mental health, but uh, you know, it's 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 worth it in the end. And of course, uh, spending some time with friends and neighbors, um, you know, our, this is my son, Andy, and his cow vanilla again. But um, I got together not too long ago with uh, um, some of my best friends from, from high school um, and uh, met up at the Stampede Ranch, had a great old time um, trying to get back into that. You get busy with your lives and your children and you kind of forget about those friends. And uh, it's great to reconnect um, with them. And even my next door neighbors are also dairy farmers. And we only really get together during like uh, New Year's Eve for, for a couple hours before we, we, uh, we nod off. But um, it's important to have those friendships. Um, have hobbies outside of the farm. Um, you know, I, one of mine is, uh, astronomy. It could be anything you want to, uh, even if it's like has to do with farming, like, uh, collecting uh, old tractors or something like that, or volunteering in a museum, have a, have a hobby outside of farming. Uh, I also collect antiques, which I love going to antique uh, places and, and, and it's a thrill to hunt, I guess. Keep up with uh, the latest information. Um, you know, all these magazines come. I, I pile them up. Um, sometimes I don't I have to wait for a rainy day to read them. Sometimes they don't get read. Um, but to, to learn something new every day is, uh, is very important for your mental health. Um, organizations that uh, do something for you um, are amazing. I know um, a DF, our Dairy Farms Ontario sent out a couple of masks during the pandemic to, to each of the families. And it was just so nice to be recognized by your organization. They, they're doing something for you directly and, and you feel like you're just kind of, you know, part of and you're kind of forgotten uh, until they do something nice. You know, some people who are anti-maskers might not appreciate it, but I, but I appreciated it. And getting near the end here, but uh, you want to remember to make your social media a place where people want to gather. There's lots of farmers that post about negativity on there and people need to know our struggles, but they also need to know that we love what we do um, and try to keep it a happy, positive place. Uh, you don't want to really be attracting uh, activists if you don't have to. You're never important to be um, too important to be nice to people. I remember that one. And would you say things uh, to people's face that you say on social media? Uh, I don't think so. Um, and those people that say nasty things on social media, um, there's usually a reason behind it. They're they're suffering. They're something going on with their mental health. Um, so show them a little kindness. It it actually can go a long way and, and turn the the corner sometimes. Uh, just a quick note: um, when you're bullied online, um, 
you need to remember, don't poke the bear. I can tell you lots of stories of people who did and it backfired on them. Uh, always engage in play conversations. Even if you disagree, um, you're representing agriculture. Uh, be positive. Be professional. Um, some people shouldn't be on social media, so please don't get on there and say anything if you can't, uh, you know, bite your tongue. Um, necessary, you know, just get rid of people. Uh, I don't do that very often, but uh, sometimes you have to. Um, you know, the screenshots and stuff uh, are great to defend yourself if you're actually attacked uh, verbally or, um, or they also make great fodder for presentations. Uh, reach out to organizations like Farm uh, Food Care and Agriculture More Than Ever. They, they can help you uh, uh, be a positive advocate and learn what to do and what not to do online. And Farm and Salt Alliance is online. You know, have some friends or fellow farmers that you can uh, join up with to or vent to if you need to. And shut it down and take a break when you need to. Um, it's important to to get away from that screen and have those uh, real life, um, real life uh, relationships with people. So just to review what I just went over, um, um, to break the stigma, we need to reduce our stress levels. Um, exercise, you know, farming doesn't always count. You know, get out there, do a bit of exercise, uh, cardiovascular. Make those real life connections, not just on social media. I wish I could be there with you in person today. Take a break, do something you love. Do something for others uh, to make you feel great. Uh, educate yourself in awareness and prevention. Uh, get help and help others in need because you, unless you can help yourself, you're not going to be able to help other people and accept who you are because, um, you know, there's, there's some things that we just cannot change about ourselves or about life or what's going on in our lives. And we need to accept some of those things, um, and realize that, uh, you know, it's not all bad and, um, there are people there who care and, and are willing to help. So, um, if you're struggling, please, um, Check out some of those resources I, I listed. Um, at the very least, um, reach out to, to East Gen or reach out to myself. Um, you can find me on social media and, and tell me what's going on because I, I am here for anyone who needs to talk. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a mental health expert, but I am a friend and I am a farmer. So um, thank you very much for having me today. And um, I appreciate any questions you may have. Thanks again. Hi, my name is Kara Enright, and this is my husband, Daryl. Together with our children, Corbin and Evelyn, we own and operate Enright Cattle Company, located at Tweed, Ontario. We have about 60 cows that we run here on the farm. They're a Simital-based herd, and we do have a little bit of an Angus influence. There's about 150 acres that. that we own, and then we rent another 50-ish acres for cropland and then we also rent about 60 or 70 acres for pasture and that's um, just to supply the the cow herd here and then our calves are finished over at my parents farm Don and Chris Longevin and they um, raise them from weaning weight up to market weight we purchase other people's calves as well after they've weaned them and we raise them with our calves from the same weaning weight to market weight and to operate that farm there's approximately 300 acres mm -hmm. of cropland to supply that we grow all our own feed for the cattle and with the exception of purchasing some corn distillers as well as just vitamin mineral salt kind of thing so um, I guess that's it. So in 2010, we were both working full-time off the farm and we were basically doing that in order to support the farm. We had maybe 30 cows-ish and I was pregnant with our, well, I had had our first son in 2009. So in 2010, we decided that we were going to put together a business plan that would allow us to have at least one of us working part time on the farm 
and eventually being able to support two of us full time on the farm. So what we did is looked at a bunch of different options of how we could do that and we decided if we couldn't come up with a way to make it sustainable for us to farm full time then we would just reduce the herd to maybe like four or five cows and ha just have a few for pets basically so that the kids could have something to, to show and play around with and um, we would be able to still balance everything out versus the way we were working crazy hours. So we put together a plan and what we decided was to try direct marketing and we started very small we were going to farmers markets one in Kingston and one in Toronto and they were a weekly market and um, from the markets is where we actually met one of our chefs he came to the stand and he bought a bit of beef and he just um, I didn't know it was a chef, just like any other normal person. And he was telling me how he was going to prepare the meal that night. And I thought, wow, I, I'd like to eat at your house. It sounds really delicious. So long behold, after he left, the, the vendor next to me said, do you know who that is? And I said, no, I have no idea. And uh, she told me, well, that's the the chef from Le Chien Noir, which was just a restaurant uh, in Kingston down the road. And I said, oh that's cool. So I went home and was like, guess what? Guess what? Like our beef's going to be at this uh, cool restaurant in Kingston. And the next week I'm at the market again and here comes the chef back. And so now I know who he is and he's like, oh, that beef was fantastic. How do I get more? And I was like, well, what do you want? <laughs> so from there, we just uh, started um, talking to him about what he would like and figuring out how we could manage to supply him and it gave us a little bit more volume that we were looking to make a, a sustainable business and so from there we started to approach other restaurants in the area because we figured if if they liked it maybe others would and um, from there it grew mm -hmm. to more restaurants and some different butcher shops and retail spaces and um, we went from kind of uh, coolers in the back of Cooler an Impala of of yeah. <laughs> to uh, we have two refrigerated vehicles now that are on the road um, every week and and we supply everything from wholesale accounts to delivering direct to your home or to your place of employment. So. So once we started working with our different chefs and and retailers and really developing relationships with these other business owners it was um, it was a big learning curve to see what did they want and and how can we work together so that they get the quality of product that they would like and we're able to sell our beef so we found that they wanted consistent a consistent product and they wanted a good quality product and if they got those two things and they were willing to pay a premium that um, that would justify that and they also would put our, our name on their menu which would allow them to uh, charge a little bit of a premium to the customer because the customer then knows where is that food coming from and they can you know look it up online and read about it or they can ask the chef in when we first started i was doing a lot of the deliveries daryl would do some of the deliveries so the chefs and the staff there at the different butcher shops and stuff would have that opportunity to ask us questions about how do we raise our cattle what do they get fed all those things that a lot of people don't have that opportunity to to find out and so that allowed us to develop a relationship with them and they find it very interesting to know yeah. what are we doing on the farm and and how do we do different things and so um, they find value in that and we of course find value in being able to sell our beef on on a regular basis at a price that is consistent so we're not following the rail grade or whatever it's not bouncing all over it's covering our co it's based on what our cost of production is and so it's covering that and allowing us to make a living so um, I think that it our brand grew from there based on um, the facts that they could get local product from this family that they knew and they could tell you how it was how it was raised and the quality and consistency was good and so they 
talk amongst themselves and you know if there's someone looking for um, beef to put on their menu or opening a new shop and they're looking for a supplier then they're talking to another person and it, the word just kind of travels and a lot of it was just word of mouth that was traveling around that this is where you could get the products and we give them a, a sample to try and it just went from there. So our business was growing and we built it in, it, it kind of went from a, the farmer's market where was our focus, but we needed to increase the volume. So as we started working more with the wholesale accounts and that was helping to increase the volume for us to make a sustainable business and, and have us more be able to have more time on the farm and less time working off the farm and so we maybe went a little bit too far where we we're at like 90 percent kind of wholesale and like 10 percent retail which was great when it was going good and then covid hit COVID. <laughs> and so the restaurants basically shut down other than i think there was three that pivoted right at that time and we had like 30 sides of beef hanging um, in the abattoir at that time. So percentage went from 90 wholesale <laughs> to 90 retail. So we had to pivot like in two days. It was really scary mm -hmm. and stressful yep. and um, luckily our our marketing team had already basically had us all set up because we were doing some home deliveries. And we wanted to do more retail. And we did want to do more but we didn't want to like immediately be bombarded no. like that um, not that we didn't want to but we weren't ready for, we were it. Set up for it so when we went to um when we, we talked about doing the home deliveries we had you know our website set up so people could order online and you could get delivered to home or you could pick up at the farm we but we had boxes ready. we had boxes already ready for that and so we had like the basics set up we had different uh, packages that you could order um, or you could build your own so that was all good that but was good but we hadn't really implemented but well we had it just wasn't it wasn't a whole lot we hadn't yes. really pushed it so then yeah. all of a sudden we had to switch to this <laughs> 90 percent you know retail and 10 percent um, wholesale to move all the beef we had and uh, what we decided to do is uh, partner up with other farmers because it, it wasn't just us that dealt mainly wholesale uh, there was other farmers like vegetable farmers and stuff who also dealt with a lot of the same restaurants as we did mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they were closed as well in the same kind of predicament and when we looked around because everyone was scared and we didn't know what was going on a lot of people in the urban areas were really afraid that they weren't going to have access to food so they were scared and and um, we thought well we can try and help these people which will also help us move the meat and other locally grown vegetables and we basically partnered up with other farmers and we put together what we called the farmers box and so it was curated of a selection of our beef and some local vegetables we had eggs we had maple syrup and we kind of changed it up depending on the season mm -hmm. and um, we picked up the products from all these other farmers and we put together boxes upon boxes of these packages and people were ordering them online we promoted them and we did contactless delivery yep. so it was you know dropped at your doorstep they paid online and you know they left a cooler out and that sort of thing and we had a system all set up and it was good and people really appreciated it because um, to them it was it was very convenient it was access to good quality food in a time when they were you know scared because they are so reliant on us for for food and it helped us because we were equally scared wondering what are we going to do with all all this beef so it worked out really well the stressful part is that like any business it's it's easier to do a gradual increase versus like a really abrupt one mm -hmm. and so we didn't have the systems in place to make that volume switch like we were based on packaging you know for example ground in 10 pound bags well now instead of one 10 pound bag it's 10 one pound bags and instead of like an entire strip line it's all cut up into little steaks and instead of being you know 50 a, pound box. a 50 pound box of like all these bigger cuts it's all these little boxes with not only our beef but also so many carrots so many this and that and it was challenging it's challenging to keep it all organized and very stressful 
and so many orders coming in that you're trying to just keep that data all together and not get it all mixed up because we were delivering from Toronto to Ottawa so trying to sort those deliveries into time like days and <laughs> it took a lot of years wow. off our life <laughs> But we survived yeah. and it was an experience. And now we know, um, like we've, we've come back. We kind of, for a little while there, we did hit a nice sweet spot where some of the restaurants had come back on board and some of the retail had slowed down. So it was a more of a natural balance. Um, and, and we still have retail and we, customers we, from them. Yes, right. we do. Um, but I would say that we have shifted back so that we're still more heavily on the wholesale and less on the retail. But we have experienced that retail part and now we know it, when we decide to push to do more there's some efficiencies that we need Logistics. to come up with yeah, yeah some things to determine but it, it did work out yeah, well because um beef, yeah. and it felt it did feel good to help to help the families that were you know looking for meat because some people were really scared we're stuck. and you know so it was good yeah it was good and we helped other farmers to get their product moved which was nice so when we put together our business plan and approached the local abattoir to um, work with us to process our meat and then of course our, um, my parents to do all the finishing, we knew the abattoir told us at some point in time that we would max them out and they kind of told us okay when we get to this many animals per week then we won't be able to do any more, it'll just max us out. So we knew at some point yep. we would probably have to do our own cutting and packaging we kind of envisioned like a cutting and packaging spot where we could control that quality and add to the volume and do different things that we'd maybe have time to do that the abattoir didn't um, but when covid hit the the um, abattoirs were just so overwhelmed and we we were also adding to the problem because instead of doing all the wholesale now we we're doing a lot more retail which was taking a lot more time of theirs mm -hmm. so they couldn't process near as many animals as we were doing no. and um they were they were trying to get a lot of meat through for everybody but um we were losing control of the quality it was starting to slip some and what we really needed was to ensure that we had a consistent quality product for our customers and we also needed to be able to process at least at the volume that we were pre-covid and um, we discussed a lot of different options of how we could approach it from building just our own cutting and packaging and bringing in carcasses so having whomever harvest the animals and bringing the carcasses to our own cutting and packaging uh, to basically um, the purchasing of an abattoir an abattoir <laughs> so uh, in January or February 1st I guess of 2021 2021? 21, 21, 21, yep. No, was it 2021? Yes. Yes, because this will be... COVID was March of 2020. That's right. So it'll be two years in February 2023. So it was... Come so, on, on two years. Yes, wow. Time flies and you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided uh. that we would purchase the abattoir. We looked... Uh, we, we This wasn't a quick decision. We talked about it for probably six or eight months and we run through all the numbers with our accountant and lawyers and different um, representatives within the industry that uh, we thought we we would like their opinion on and that we trusted and finally um, I said to Daryl you know why don't we just go tour it we're just gonna go look at it we're gonna go I knew we're gonna then. we're just gonna go look we're at it look don't at worry it. just looking that, at I it remember you get back yeah. in the car yeah. yeah so we went we had a look and we toured and you know it had the kill floor it had the cutting and packaging it had a nice little retail store it even had the smoker so we could make jerky and the pepperettes all that further processing that I thought would be so cool so, mm -hmm. so cool so we get back in the car and Daryl says well do you remember what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> we just bought an abattoir. <laughs> and he and uh, <laughs> Daryl says, we just bought an abattoir, didn't we? And I'm like, yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so now we own an abattoir mm -hmm. and it came with some employees 
they're really great. A lot of them were uh, retirement age. Mm -hmm. The majority of the butchers, well actually all the butchers, were retirement age. The one younger one was the owner's son and he didn't want to take it over so he um, he wasn't even interested in carrying on within the business. Yeah. So um, that left us with you know a gap on butchers and it was really about skilled skilled labor is what we really needed um, because it really is a trade like it butchery is. is a trade you can't um, you can't just teach someone how to do it in a couple of days yep. it's something that you need a lot of practice at to get really good and to become efficient at it yep. so um, that was one of our big challenges with the abattoirs just getting that skilled labor and what we decided to do because I <laughs> like most of the industry there's not a lot of everyone's looking for labor and you don't just have a a folder of all these butcher resumes <laughs> like they just there's not very many of them definitely not younger ones so we decided to implement um a training in-house mm -hmm. so we have trained um, three three butchers three yeah and our head butcher she's young 30 eight ish yeah, and please. yeah and then our next butcher in line he's 27 and we're training another um, young lady to um, be on the block as well and she's only 27 so we're really trying to pass that skill down to the next generation so that we can continue with that that trade yep. and we've been promoting that and so now we do have young people coming to us actively seeking and saying hey i'm interested when uh when could we chat or would this be something that you could teach me? And so it's it's starting to come out, work yeah. out now, but there's definitely lots of challenges. Like there was a huge learning curve on operating an abattoir and just all the moving parts because there was so many different pieces from like even just with the ready to eat products and the raw products and all the... The regulations so there was a lot to learn we were really lucky because the uh, previous owner he stayed on with us for three or four months yep. before he retired so he did a lot to teach us what what we had to learn <laughs> and then the employees that were there the staff that was there they also helped teach us a lot and we still, still have learning. we still have a lot to learn yes a lot to learn but um i'd say that we both really enjoy learning oh, and, for sure. yeah. and I think we'll learn forever yeah. and so that's something that I guess is good because um, when you're taking on new new challenges like this there is lots to learn but the staff was good um, to help as well yep. so it's it's starting to come together but it definitely for a while there was a few nights where we said like what like, did we do what have we done yeah, yeah. So we have a lot of our family that works everywhere from the farm, of course, and then even at the abattoir, my mom works there three days a week running the retail. Daryl's mom works there one day a week. And we often have Harold, Daryl's dad, doing errands, running into town, bringing us this, bringing us that. Um, Corbin, our son, he loves the farm. So he can feed the cows, operate all the equipment, do whatever, that's his passion. We do make him come to the abattoir, <laughs> make patties, uh, maybe tray sausages. It's not Learning his thing, it's not his thing, but I say you can't just do what you like. You gotta do some other yep. things as well. And then there's Evelyn, she's only eight, but she loves the retail, retail store. So she comes and she will serve customers day in, day out, and they give her tips. Tips all the time. So she comes home with this pocket of tips and then we have to stop at the at the little corner store yeah. on the way home so she can get a treat. Yeah. Usually it's a, a slushy or ice cream. So it's great, she loves that, and it's a really good experience for her. She can run the cash, debit everything they both enjoy it they do enjoy it um so we i guess work we bring them to work everywhere whether it's the abattoir or the farm it's a little bit trickier getting them to the abattoir because it's an hour drive away whereas at the farm they can just jump off the bus and and come help but i think um the more time we get them down at the abattoir or out here the better so they can learn what it's like and decide uh, what they would like to do if they're interested mm -hmm. 
So when we started having to use the CCIA tags to um, be able to have your cattle leave the farm, we decided to embrace that and use the CCIA tags <laughs> for electronically tracking um, all the different events that happen to each animal. So it's basically their electronic uh, record. So we um, have a scanner that scans their ear and we can enter in if they're vaccinated or if we've just given them antibiotics it creates a withdrawal time for them mm -hmm. and then um, weaning weights or if we've moved them over to dads um, everything right through to when we're shipping them and it basically is an electronic record for them so all major events get recorded that way yep. and then as the animal um, goes on to the abattoir that number follows through but the nice part is that you know keep track of like their average daily gain and um, and at the abattoir we scan out as that animal is being broken down into the different pieces of meat each package is labeled uh, on that label there's a barcode and embedded in that barcode is the CCIA tag number so then we can tell you if you buy a steak from us what animal that came from or we can tell you where every part of that animal went so we can do a recall within a few seconds and just punching a bit on my computer and that's nice so that um, if ever it was necessary, we know with, that we do have the ability, so hopefully it's not necessary, necessary, but it does work well. And it's nice because we can look back and see, rebuild a carcass and see how much saleable meat we got, awesome. because there is actually quite a bit of variation from carcass to carcass mm -hmm. as to how much saleable meat you, you got, how much money that carcass made you. And um, we have it so that, we can enter in a grade. So at the abattoir, there is, there's not, it, the beef is not graded, but we could, for our own purposes, not something that you can say, you can't say it's a specific grade for sale, but for our own tracking purposes, we can give it a grade and we can do a measurement of back fat and another measurement in the ribeye that will do a quick calculation of the saleable meat for that carcass. Um, it's something that we haven't started implementing yet because no. we haven't had time, but it is there that we can implement um, whenever we get time and then we can track and see. And our intention was to have it so that we could identify those carcasses that were really working well in our system and then we would try and replicate them. So we could tell, know which cow family was better than the other. Yes. However, what we're finding is even like identical twins have so much variation. variation. There's so much variation within the beef industry that it's hard to, when you, when we have this like perfect carcass coming down, you've got beautiful marbling and it yields well and whatever. And you're like, yes, that's what I, I want to get another one of, but it's really hard to replicate that. And um, so when we're picking, you know, our bulls and stuff, we are looking at all the EPDs, mostly based on carcass um, traits, other than the few, um, few cows that we're breeding specifically for replacement heifers. And that we're always looking for a good marbling um, bull and also a decent back fat, easy keeping, that sort of thing um, for all the cows that we're breeding for, mainly for, for the carcasses, so. So part of our philosophy has always been to try and be as sustainable as possible. And that includes everything from how we manage our soil and water and animals to how do we utilize all of the animal. And we're a small family farm. We know all of our cows, the majority of them have names. Our kids name them. And um, I guess from there, we, we've always said, you know, we want to give them the best life possible until that final day. And so at that final day, then it's like, okay, well now we want to make sure that we utilize the whole animal, right? Sure. So, so yeah, how do we use everything? And so we use obviously all of the beef and the bones and organs, but then we wanted to take it one step further. And so <clears throat> what we do is, um, have the hides tanned here in Ontario, and then they're handcrafted into a variety of leather bags, um, accessories. We've had boots and furniture, you name it, we've tried it with the leather, which is 
Pretty cool. Yep. And um, then we also use the the tallow, the kidney fat, and we've render it down, and it's made into um, soap and hand balm and candles yeah. and that sort of thing. So it's just about what can we not waste? How can we utilize every part of it? And we're always looking for different ideas and different parts that are currently not being used to utilize it, not only to increase your profit on that animal, but also just to respect it because we put so much sweat and tears and, <laughs> and work into raising that animal that, well, let's not waste it. Let's utilize it. And um, so that's what we stick by. And that's what we're always kind of trying to come up with new ideas to fulfill. So my advice to anyone that is thinking about direct marketing or starting any new venture venture within their business sure. yes that um i guess to put together a business plan like we we did that in 2009 Seems like <laughs> to start our direct marketing and we've been updating it obviously ever since but it's something that allowed us to put together a budget to see to cost everything out and see is it going to be feasible to do this or not and who is going to do what because there's a lot of tasks that you don't necessarily think about doing and um there'll be things changing huh? there's things yeah there's definitely it's your plan you can change it however you see fit but have a goal in mm -hmm. mind have a goal written out of where you want to be a direction and make sure that everybody that's part of your plan whether that's your partners or your family or whatever but anyone that's part of the plan they need to read the plan and know what direction so you guys are all pulling in the same direction and then when right. opportunities come up you're ready so whether it's daryl that runs into an opportunity um or or me or my parents or my kids or whatever whomever then they're like hey did you know this existed yeah and i guess um my my other word of advice which gerald's gonna laugh at but i always just kind of uh brainstorm as if there's no limitations no limitations like mm -hmm. as if resources weren't a limit so if I was daydreaming, wouldn't it be cool if, yep. and that's kind of our goal, like wouldn't mm -hmm. it be cool if mm -hmm. one day my bag was made out of leather from our own cows? <laughs> yeah. That'd be so cool, right? And so then all of a sudden when you start thinking about it and then you start making connections and we have a, a pretty big network that we, that we utilize all the time. Like we have a lot of really good people that have awesome skills. Yep. And so we rely on them to help us and so that's good but when you dream big then things just sometimes kind of come around like wouldn't it be so cool if we owned our own avatar you wouldn't it? <laughs> well maybe not but. <laughs> <laughs> anyways it's uh stuff like that that really the plan helps you put everything together and keep you grounded and know okay this is where we're going and yeah. this is how we're getting there when you set a goal aim for it like we did and then you make a new goal once you hit that first one, you can continue. That's right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the East Gen Beef Bulletin. I'm happy to be here tonight to talk about our beef sire lineup of what we've got currently in the catalog, as well as some uh, new releases that we'll have for 2023. So again, thanks everybody for taking time out of their evening and we'll make this fairly quick so that everybody can get back to their very busy lives. Um, but feel free to reach out to me at any time. I will be around later this evening to answer any questions live um, that you may have. So feel free to fire away and, and we'll try to answer them the best we can. Um, but I'm pretty excited about the lineup that we've got. I, you know, I think there's a lot of depth of quality. Um, there's a lot of different options for everybody and there's a lot of different types of cattle that, that'll fit everybody's needs and wants, uh, both from a phenotype standpoint as well as a data standpoint. I think it's really important that we touch base on um, CMAX's breeding philosophy of, of combining phenotype and data and making sure that we're really taking a balanced breeding approach, um, ensuring that we've got uh, both types of cattle in the same package. So with that, I'll move into the presentation here this evening. The bull we're going to start off this evening with is a new bull to the lineup called Tanker. Tanker is a casino bomber 
Bomber Sun um, that's just got a really, really impressive data set coupled with an equally impressive phenotype. This is a bull that's probably one of the most exciting sires that we were able to find in 2022 bull sale season. Uh, he's a bull that, again, just has that abundance of muscle shape and thickness. When you get in behind this bull, he's extremely wide-based and wide down that top line um, with a ton of muscle shape and capacity. We own this bull with peaked out ranch, so there's going to be a really good um, sample of calves that are going to be able to come next spring. And, you know, I think with that sample size, we're also going to see this data set even get stronger. Uh, this is a bull that, that's got a reasonable birth weight and, and takes off all the way to 172 yearling weight EPD, uh, coupled with a quite a good marbling and ribeye carcass data uh, to go along with that for Canadian producers. This is one that, that comes by this data pretty honestly. His dam is backed by consecutive generations of Pathfinder dams, um, so performance is certainly in the and the pedigree of this guy. The next bull that I wanted to talk to tonight about is this preference bull. So this isn't a new bull for the catalog this year. We actually had this bull in the book last year, but really excited with how this bull's matured and stud and, and the way that he's he's grown out. Um, this is a bull that's got a pretty impressive VPD set again, lots of growth, really good carcass traits, a bull that's just overall though really, really impressive in person. I really love how extended he is through that front one third, a bull that's got a long, a long spine to him, couples that with lots of dimension down through that lower quarter and just gives that overall really nice eye appeal. This is one that I think is, is going to be a standout. Um, he's going to be used by a few breeders um, that are looking for that, that high performance and, and still give a really nice look. From what we've seen, and I've seen, I guess, in, in my travels, these Baldridge alternative sons have, have done quite well. Um, and I'm pretty excited to see what this preference bull can do for our lineup, both from a phenotype standpoint as well as data. And another sire that, that needs no introduction, I'm sure, but a bull that we're going to talk a little bit more about tonight is the Schiffelbein Attractive. Um, you know, true to his, his name, he's a bull that's very attractive put together, but he does so in a, in a really powerful package. And that's really why he stood the test of time. He's, breeders have used him, and we're going to look at some progeny here next on the next slide um, that really outlines what this bull is all about. And here's some of these progeny of these Schiffelbein attractives. So we, first off, we've got a heifer calf here, um, you know, a heifer calf that's just really powerful in her design, really elegant as way she travels about the pasture here. Um, one that's just got that breed character. She's really deep spined, um, really attractive through that front one third and, and just really balanced individual and, and has possesses a lot of growth. And as we see these heifer calves grow and turn into breads, you know, we see that depth of capacity come. And, and here's the next one that we've got as a bred heifer. You know, as we see these cattle mature, we, they just get deeper, bolder ribbed. They possess more and more muscle shape, and they still keep that really elegant front one-third to them. These are cattle that are that are really popular and sell in high demand, and, and I think something that can be well used by a lot of Angus breeders. High cotton would be another bull that would be returning to our book after a couple of years in the book already. But this is a sire that I, that I wanted to outline for a couple of reasons. One, really, really impressed with how this bull is matured and stud. Again, really long spine, tons of muscle shape and capacity about him. Um, but this is a bull that, again, unique to our lineup, it is available in both sorted male and, and female semen. Um, this is one that I think when we look at is data set, um, with low birth, high calving, he's direct and, and good spread up to yearling weight and carrying that right through into some pretty nice um, carcass traits. You know, really like to see um, how much performance this individual has and know that he's available as a sexed option. This is a bull that I think is going to get used for a variety of different reasons. Uh, really strong through that milk EPD and maternal side of things as well. Um, one I think that we can that we can use in a number of different avenues, and again available in conventional semen as well as sorted male and female for both commercial and purebred producers. A personal favorite of mine is this Musgrave Colossal. Uh, Colossal's have been a bull that we've had in the book for a number of years now, and, and rightfully so. He's led off the catalog. He's been a bull that's, that's been a mainstay in our program. This is one that I think can be used for a number of reasons as well. You know, I think the biggest thing for him is that he's a really good calving east sire with, with good calving east direct and low birth. Um, but not only is he just a calving east bull, he, he gives some bold muscle shape and, and a really bold sprung a rib. 
these are cattle that are going to be extremely maternal uh, as we start to see them calve in. Coming from the Musgrave program that, that's been widely known for their maternal attributes and 316 himself. From a growth standpoint, you know, he's certainly a moderate frame bull, but I think when we compare him to a sire, he is going to throw just a shot more growth in there than what we see out of the 316s. And I think that's coming from the big sky and the maternal side of the pedigree. This is a bull that, that we certainly can use with confidence to increase some marbling scores, uh, improve foot quality, and again, just that bold, robust rib shape with some muscle shape down through that lower quarter uh, really makes this bull an attractive sire uh, in the heifer pen. As we move into our Charlet lineup, we've got a new sire called Blueprint. This will be a carbon copy sun that's been really popular um, down south of the border. And, and, you know, I think when I saw this bull in person, he, he really impressed me as well. This is a bull that, that's got some pretty impressive calving ease data and a big spread in through his yearling weight and weaning weights. Um, but this is a bull that's equally as impressive when you see him in person. You know, from this picture, I would I would say that the bull maybe doesn't look like he's got a ton of muscle shape or maybe a real square hip to him. But when you see this bull in person, he's got a ton of hip, lots of lower quarter, a bull that still maintains that depth of body and attractiveness that you like to see, a real nice angular shoulder to this bull. Um, and a bull, when we set him in motion, I really like the way that he moves about the, about the pitcher pen when we're working on him. Um, but again, I think this bull exemplifies what the CMEX brand is all about. And, and combining really good phenotype with some pretty impressive data. Another strong addition to our already strong Charlet lineup. Continuing into our Charlet lineup, we've got the Level Up Sire that we've had for a couple of years and, and out of the time-tested uh, Roundup Sire. sire. The reason I wanted to bring this bull up here, we've seen a number of progeny now working around the globe in, in a number of different herds, um, both commercial as well as purebred. Um, but this is a bull that we're also going to have the option of selling male and female sorted semen on. Uh, this is a bull that, that we've got um, extremely long length of spine, lots of lower quarter and muscle shape. His dam has been an absolute standout. Um, he comes in a homozygous pole package and just a, an excellent option for, for sorted semen. Um, this is one that can be used both in commercial herds if we're trying to make more male calves uh, or in some purebred herds that are looking for some replacement heifers with that maternal strength behind him. Uh, I think this is a sire that we're going to see a lot more of as he gets used. Our Hereford division, we, we didn't add a new sire this year, but, you know, a bull that's certainly been used widely across the globe um, and certainly in, in North America, uh, the Boulder sire. This is a Lambo sign that, that's just got a ton of muscle shape and capacity about him. And we've got a couple progeny here that we'll talk about, but a bull that we certainly can use in the heifer pen and, and you know, add a lot of phenotype and breed character as we look at what he's done already in, in, the, in the show ring as, as well as the breeding pastures. You know, and along with that bold sprung rib and muscle shape, we get these calves that, that have a ton of pigment. And I think the two we have here as an examples are, are really good examples of that. You know, these, these cattle just, they put a lot of pigment into these cattle. They put some, some muscle shape and some capacity, a lot of maternal attributes about them. They're cattle that, that move quite freely and, and stride out and on, with lots of flex on both ends. Uh, really good angle to these cattle, both through their shoulder and, and through their hip placement. Um, I think there's a lot of functionality in these cattle, and we're going to only can see these continue to develop and mature as they get a little bit older. They're going to keep getting more bold sprung and, and develop just like the sire did himself. Um, again, a little bit more modern in stature, but we can see in both of these examples, lots of capacity um, and ease of flushing. Moving into our Simitol lineup, a, a sire that we're extremely excited to have acquired this spring. Um, you know, one that, that's got a commanding presence and, and certainly needs to be put on the use list. Um, this is a homozygous pulled option uh, from Ericsson, Ericsson Asset. Uh, this is a bull that, that's out of um, uh, an Ericsson female that's sired by Sheriff and, and along with that brings that calving ease that that, that sire has been known for and, and we see some growth and performance there um, coming from the paternal side of this pedigree. A calving ease bull that, that's got really good spread from birth to yearling, um, 
really dark red sire or sire again that's that's got a smooth pulled look to them and and certainly one that we're really excited about uh, to add to the already really strong Simotel program um, that we've got started here at, at CMAX. Initially, this spool is going to be limited in quantity uh, just because he, he was a little late getting to stud for collection. Um, but now that we've got him uh, in, in stud and in isolation, we're eagerly waiting uh, the first semen that he's going to produce. Uh, an excellent addition to our, again, already strong Simitol lineup. And the last breed that I want to introduce um, this new sires from this tonight is the Speckle Park breed. Um, certainly uh, a bull that we're extremely excited about, though. This is a bull that, that came with a lot of anticipation, a bull that we had pre-orders on before we even purchased the bull from Australia, um, and this that is KFC Judgment Call. Uh, anybody that's a purebred breeder, I'm sure, will already know about this bull and, and how well he sold through their sale back in the springtime. But this is a bull that, that for uh, a Speckle Park um, is certainly one that, that we're pretty proud to own and, and one that I think can add, add, offer the breed a lot of attributes. And as I mentioned, we were, we were already pre-sold on this bull actually um, as we were purchasing him. Um, this is one that I think is, is going to be extremely popular and, and producing really great semen today uh, already.